A Scanner Darkly is a truly unique Descent into Madness film made in 2006, directed by Richard Linklater. It has a hell of a cast. It's got a rotoscoping, vector tracing animation style I'd never seen before. It's based off the novel by Philip K. Dick of the same name that I love equally. And all I could think is, wow, what could I say about A Scanner Darkly besides how awesome it is? And it turns out, ooh, a lot. I could say, a lot, and I am going to. My name's Dash and Grizzly, and I'm completely unqualified. Given its complex character motivations and commentary on identity fuckery, analyzing this film would have been a rabbit hole in and of itself, but upon further inspection, it has become abundantly clear that I must talk about the novel in tandem with the film. Like I said, there's some serious identity fuckery going on. Even if you've seen the movie, shit gets slippery, so we're gonna have to do an immediate headcount so that you know exactly who is who. Charles Freck, I love Charles Freck. He's one of my favorite characters in this movie, but he's an amalgamation of three different characters from the novel. In order of appearance, you have Jerry Fabin, and he's the, the man with the dog who takes a shower, who finds these imaginary aphids all over himself. This is one of the funniest opening credit scenes ever. I love it. So after that, from host opening credit scenes up until his suicide attempt, we get the character that you see in the book. Great character, awesome mannerisms, schizophrenic and, 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 and disturbed, done right. Love everything about it. And at the very end of the film, he's playing Mike, who has the great line, the living, he thought, should never be used to serve the purposes of the dead. But the dead should, if possible, serve the purposes of the living. And that character's name is Mike. Second character to look into is our alleged main character. I have some disputes with that, but it's Bob Arctor. Now, I would not blame you for thinking, oh, look, this, this is three characters. And I was with you for a while. After a second, third, thousandth glance, I think we have four characters on our hands. We have Bob Arctor. We have Bob Arctor in his scramble suit, codenamed Fred. We have Bruce after he's entered into New Path and is working on the farm. And then we have Bob Arctor before all of this happened. Bob Arctor with his family. Now, during all of Fred's speeches, he mentions his little ones. What I fear night and day is that our children, your children and my children. I have two little ones. Very little but this is all scripted. But we know that he used to have children through these flashbacks, we see that. He later tells Hank right before he gets admitted into New Path. Like I tell my kids, I've got two kids, two girls, little ones. I don't believe you do. You're not supposed to. And let's not forget the scene where he's leaving work, internal dialogue, he's thinking about himself in the third person, and as soon as he gets in clear shot of his home, he starts talking about the potential of the house, not knowing that is his past exactly. What a waste of a truly good house. So much could be done with it. A family and children could live here. It was designed for that. Something about it is uncanny and unsettling, and I would not usually use real-life experience to explain away a theory in a movie, but post-concussion syndrome and behavioral neuropathy are something that have affected me and my loved ones on a deep, fundamental level. I have watched people change, become strangers to me off of small, seemingly insignificant injuries. Throughout the film, we hear these drug-induced, paranoia-fueled, conspiratorial talks about the infamous they, an intangible individual who sabotages the group of Arctor, Ernie, and Barris. From breaking Arctor's cephoscope by clipping wires in the novel, to rigging the car to accelerate uncontrollably, to gypsies stealing gears from an 18-speed bike and passing it off as the genuine article. 
the who planted the holograms or cameras all over the house, etc. Some of these are misunderstandings. The miscalculation on the bike gears, for example. Some of these are parallel thinking. Donna installing the hollow scanners and Barris allegedly installing the thumbnail cameras. He did it. He really did Of course it's Barris. He thrives on conflict. No wonder he's a domestic terrorist. The sociopath makes a game out of telling Frick he could totally sleep with Donna in exchange for a gram of coke. He tampers with the card knowing hollow scanners are going to be installed. The smug, anticipatory look on his face right before he mentions passing a slow 18 wheeler. That is slow, folks. Oh, uh, get around, will you? Move, Not to inconvenience my own argument, but in the novel, Ernie Luckman is the one to suggest moving around the Safeway truck. Barris is the intangible they he constantly fearmongers others to believe in, disguising sabotage from a supposed friend as bad luck. Motherfucker! They did it deliberately! This just, we almost died! We almost fucking got us, man! This is Mike Westaway. He might be the most compassionate person in the novel, and in the movie has been reduced to a superficially charming, borderline creepy driver. All of his great conversations with Bruce have been boiled down to one awkward one. His demeanor shifts dramatically from his interactions with Bruce and his interactions with Donna. So much so that even after multiple watches, you might not notice that it's the same person. The conversation he has with Donna Hawthorne at the end of the novel is the most resonant and powerful section of the story, while being mere exposition in the movie. You might recognize the name, Mike. That's because Charles Freck's third persona delivers lines that are meant to be Mike's internal dialogue as he drops Bruce off at the farm. Mike and Donna have been working together for a long time trying to get someone into new paths supply system. Donna Hawthorne is by far the most interesting character in this story. She is undercover law enforcement, she has been for a very long time, and she is tired. She has done some very questionable things in the name of a greater good that has sapped her of her will to continue doing this job. While in her scramble suit, she goes by the codename Hank. She is Bob Arctor's superior. Because of this, she has sold him down the river. She has spread some lies about how deep into the drug world he is, so that it will be beyond a shadow of a doubt whether or not he has any attachments to law enforcement when they try to extract that information out of him in New Path. The film has shoehorned in a third identity for Donna, presumably that has been a pseudonym the whole time, and her real name is Audrey, as Mike calls her. No such mention in the book. So, yeah. Lots of identity fuckery. Hey, now that we're uh, just about eight minutes in and I've finally got around to introducing everybody, let's talk about Donna Hawthorne's genius, cold manipulation of Bob Arctor. She has a team, Mike and the agent on the right, responsible for his mental well-being through his objective as a narc, to bust higher up dealers. The highest of which he has in his contacts is Donna Hawthorne. What about, uh, Donna Hawthorne? I'm systematically working up to her supplier. The quantities I'm buying now are basically beyond her capacity. She doesn't have enough front money to handle it, so it's just a matter of time before she's hooking me up with the next person up the ladder. Also known as Hank, uh, Fred's boss. Their primary objective is to implant subconscious imagery into his brain that he will later associate with them, law enforcement and his friends, so that when he is introduced to stimuli that fits those descriptions, he will snap out of it while in New Path and overcome the permanent cognitive impairments Substance D is known for. This is, at very best, a gamble. Their secondary objective is to systematically wear him down so that he seems desperate enough to be taken into New Path. They only take the most broken, addicted, desperate, dope-sick patients with no family, friends, or law enforcement affiliation. 
Their screening process is highly intensive. Combined with the vulnerable state of their dope-sick applicants, information is easy to extract. And given the slightest reason to, they will reject said applicant. Bob Arctor never being told of the mission is the only way he would be accepted into New Path. The combination of these objectives results in him remembering crucial elements, colors, landscapes, foliage, substance D, etc. Not so that he can remember their mission to infiltrate New Path, but so that he can learn of their mission to infiltrate New Path without ever having been told. How does he look? I mean, do you think he's going to be able to pull through for us? I guess all we can do is hope that when he finally gets in there, a few charred brain cells will flicker on and some distant instinct will kick in. So, let's get into the meat of these manipulative tactics used by Donna Hawthorne and her teammates. Not that much. So this movie is very self-referential. It drops the subtlest of hints, and of course we know that Hank is Donna Hawthorne. But check out this line that Fred, Bob Arctor says, to the agents taking care of his well-being. If you guys are psychologist types and you've been monitoring my endless debriefings with Hank, tell me, what the hell is Donna Steele? What the hell is What the hell is What the hell is Read your penal code. An officer who willingly becomes an addict and doesn't report it promptly is subject to a misdemeanor charge, a fine, and or six months. Really? I had to. You could have pretended to. Most officers managed to cope with it. We never see Donna ingest the illicit drugs they're talking about doing. Look, I do a lot of coke, okay? We see her insist they pop some caps of death. A little kick back, drop some death. We see her tell Arctor she smoked a joint. Smoke a joint before you crashed. Uh, yeah. We see her acting aloof, faded, and disoriented. But remember, you could have pretended to. Now, just like my position earlier with Ernie Luckman being the one to tell Bob Archer to pass the slow-moving truck in the car kerfuffle, I don't want to discredit my argument. But in the book, it is worth mentioning that Donna does heaps of hash, or at least says she does. And we do get to see her actually partake in the act. And apparently they do it often. They as in Bob Arctor and Donna. They do it as a replacement for sex, blowing it in each other's face after they themselves have taken a hit. And they do this back and forth all night until the hash is gone. On a routine basis. Although, I don't think this stops her from faking the effects you would normally associate with someone who is an addict. But only sometimes, depending on how it can be advantageous to her. That Donna chick. Bob's girl? His girl. Although I know for a fact it never gets in her pants. Donna has an aversion to bodily contact. And junkies lose their interest in sex, you realize, due to a organ swelling up from vasoconstriction. There is a pattern within scenes that shows anytime Donna is on screen, she will be uninterested in physical contact in one half of the scene and inviting physical contact in the other half. If, however, someone invites themselves into her personal bubble, she refuses them. No. Physical contact is only okay when she initiates Bob. it. So, of course, this isn't genuine. It's her playing him to the nth degree. She needs these interactions to be on her terms so that he can be malleable in her hands. She doesn't want him to love her. She just wants to make sure that his emotions are controlled by her so that it fits the agenda of getting him into New Path. They need him to be only a certain amount of stable and then to fall very, very hard off the deep end. This is one of the few instances where you really could say the road to hell is paved with good intentions without sounding like a pseudo-philosopher. Arctor goes the entire story thinking it's the Lions Club speech that gets him in hot water. But the thing that got codename Fred caught up with these two agents, one of which Donna is working with, if this is about the speech I gave, is the bullshitting between Fred and Hank, where Fred mentions the what do you think happened to the missing gears conversation. While the group was trying to figure out where the missing gears went, 
They simply didn't have the cognitive ability to realize that you have to multiply the gears in the front and the back instead of adding them together. They ask the first person they see on the street to explain to them how many gears they think is on the bike, and the answer is so detailed that their embarrassment screams hilarity on the page through silence and shame. So in a conversation we didn't get to see take place, Fred mentions the whole where did the gears go conversation, he doesn't mention being corrected, and he carries on speaking as though he still doesn't understand how to determine how many gears are on a bike. Or, to put it specifically as possible and give an example as to why this is the case, his brain degradation has reached a point where he knows how to do addition and multiplication just fine, but his brain can't decide which of the rudimentary tasks to perform given the current problem. We have seen them work on the car. We've seen Ernie, Barris, and Arctor all working on the car, fixing the car, troubleshooting the car when they encounter a problem, and finding the solution quickly. It's not an information problem. It's not an intelligence problem. It's a connectivity problem. Ergo, red flag. <laughs> I imagine that Donna lets a great many of conversations happen with these cognitive slip-ups. fuckers. Wait, wait, wait. Are you sure there are only nine gears on this bike? Eight. Okay, eight, nine, whatever. Don't you think that before we go over and accuse and start some shit, we should find out for sure? When she is Donna and he is Arctor, or when she is Hank and he is Fred, and since all of their conversations and debriefings get logged, whether through the hollow scanners in the home or with law enforcement protocol in their scramble suits, Donna allows and encourages these slip-ups one step closer to Arctor being burnt out and put into New Path. Donna has a very human approach to guilt management. After picking him up, Arctor tries to explain Barris' sabotage and neglect brand of abuse, after watching Barris do nothing as Ernie nearly died. You may have watched that and thought, man, that is fucked up, but the text is much more malicious, cruel, and unusual in nature, so I'll leave that up for a second if you want to pause and read. Knowing what we know about Donna, watch her face, listen to the deflection in her response, and then the passive admission that she hates herself. That fucking Barris. You know how he works? He doesn't kill anybody but he hangs around until the situation arises where they die. And then he just sits there. And he sort of sets them up in the first place while he stays out of it. But I'm not sure how. Hey, do you have that money for the stuff? I need it tonight. Yeah, I have it. Okay. You know, I don't like Barris. Despite all of this, there's no such thing as a situation Donna can't take advantage of. I don't trust him. He's fucking crazy. When you're around him, you start acting crazy. And then when you're not around him, you're fine. You're acting crazy now. Just because it's true doesn't mean it's not manipulative. Earlier on, I brought forth a point that I was certain somebody was going to be watching and thinking, oh, well, well, this guy's just a woman hater. She doesn't want him to love her. She just wants to make sure that his emotions are controlled by her. I know every misandrist has a special little place in their heart for calling misogyny, but Donna is my favorite character. Hate to burst your bubble. Right now, she is telling Arctor that he acts crazy whenever he spent time around Barris, and whatever is going on in his head, she knows that it's fucking with him. So she pulls this little stunt. Hey, will you take me to a concert next weekend at Anaheim Stadium? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which night? Uh, it's Sunday afternoon. <laughs> whatever you want. Aw, th th that's so sweet. Yeah, I would think that too. Except for the fact that Hank is the one that decides when they're pulling the trigger to send him to New Path. And she's Hank. She knows he's not going to be there next Sunday. He's g g g g g g g gone bitch. 
genius. She's already got plenty enough evidence to send Barris away. He's incriminated himself enough. That's the big case with Arctur's involvement. Now she can send him out the dry, and she's chosen tonight to give him plenty of subliminal messages about going up north, living on a farm, being in a cabin, being around mountains, and saying whenever he goes up there, she'll be there too. Wow. Damn it, Don is awesome. Fucking great. What do I do? I mean, how do you make it with that kind of sweet, unique, stubborn little chick? You could buy her flowers. Really? This time of year, you can get little blue flowers at any nursery. Give them to her. You know what I want to do someday, Bob? I want to move north, live on a farm near the mountains. Like mountains, Bruce? The cabin. Can I go with you? I hope so. 